In the name of Christ our Lord, I welcome you to this time of worship and invite you to prepare yourselves to worship God. Take a few deep breaths and allow the Spirit to fill your body and your soul. On this day, when we remember all the ways God speaks to us, in the rushing wind, in the dancing flames, in the words we understand, and in everything that transcends language, let us join together in wonder to marvel at creation and to praise God, our Creator who both creates and sustains, and in every generation gives new life to the earth with awe humility and gratitude, let us worship our God. Will you join us in reciting the call to worship? We come into God's presence this day through the power of God's Holy Spirit. Come, come Holy, Holy Spirit. Spirit. Holy Spirit of God, you come like the wind of heaven, unseen, unbidden. Holy, Holy Spirit, Spirit of God, God. You give, you give us, us courage and fire and, and strength, strength, renewing our world with, with grace and hope. hope. Come, Holy Spirit, let us worship God. this day we remember that God comes to us in our isolation and wavering hope. On this day, we celebrate that the Spirit breathes new life into our weary spirits. On this day, we affirm that Jesus restores us to new visions of life together. Let us speak our lives as we pray, first in silence and then together. And now, let us pray together. Creative God, you poured your spirit upon gathered disciples, creating bold tongues, open ears, and a new community of faith. We confess that we hold back the force of your spirit among us. We do not listen to your word of grace. We do not speak your good news of love. We do not live as a people made one in Christ. Have mercy on us, O God. Transform our timid lives by the power of your Spirit and fill us with a startling desire to be your faithful people, doing your will for the sake of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. Listen. 
Today we hear an old story, but it's also our story. The day may not bring a mighty wind, it may come with just a soft whisper. But this is our Pentecost. This is our reminder that God forgives us and fills us with gratitude and purpose. Let us give thanks to God. Amen. in song and dance. The song is composed and sung by Ruth Ann Svensson. The dance is choreographed by Marjorie Hoyer Smith. Will you join your hearts with us as we pray? Today's reading from Acts is Luke's account of the birth of the church. The disciples have been waiting in Jerusalem for the promised spirit to guide them into what's next, and as promised, the spirit arrives, changing everything. Listen now for what the spirit speaks to our lives today through this reading from Acts chapter two. 
verses 1 through 21. When the day of Pentecost had come, they were all together in one place. And suddenly from heaven there came a sound like the rush of a violent wind, and it filled the entire house where they were sitting. Divided tongues as of fire appeared among them, and a tongue rested on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other languages as the Spirit gave them ability. Now there were devout Jews from every nation under heaven living in Jerusalem. And at this sound, the crowd gathered and was bewildered because each one heard them speaking in the native language of each. Amazed and astonished, they asked all, are not all these who are speaking Galileans? And how is it that we hear each of us in our own language? Parthians, Medes, Elamites, and residents of Mesopotamia, Judea, and Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, Figuria and Pamphylia, Egypt and the parts of Libya belonging to Cyrene, and visitors from Rome, both Jews and proselytes, Cretans and Arabs, in our own languages, we hear them speaking about God's deeds of power. All were amazed and perplexed, saying to one another, what does this mean? But others answered and said, they are filled with new wine. But Peter, standing with the 11, raised his voice and addressed them. Men of Judea and all who live in Jerusalem, let this be known to you and listen to what I say. Indeed, these are not drunk, for it is only nine o'clock in the morning. No, this is what was spoken through the prophet Joel. In the last days it will be, God declares, that I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. Even upon my slaves, both men and women, in those days I will pour out my spirit, and they shall prophesy. And I will show portents in the heaven above, and signs on the earth below, blood and fire and smoky mist. The sun shall be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the coming of the Lord's great and glorious day. Then everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. This ends the reading for today. May God bless it to our understanding and deepen our faith through it. Thanks be to God. Amen. So uh, a friend of mine went out to dinner with his partner recently. First time out since uh, all the COVID restrictions had us sheltering at home. And as they were seated, the waiter brought them cocktail menus and uh, explained that the Drinks at the top were, um, you know, their ordinary concoctions and uh, some of their favorites. While as you went further down the list, the more spirit forward the drinks became. Confused, my friends asked, spirit forward? Yes, replied the waiter, as if everybody should know what that means. And there was a long pause. I don't quite understand, he said. And the waiter sheepishly explained that further down the, the further down the menu you went, the more alcohol intense the drinks became. Uh, needless to say, my friend, who's a pastor, was slightly offended uh, that uh, the spirit that we celebrate today was being connected to alcohol. But you know that's a long history. Anyway, the story Linda read this morning is one we return to year after year to talk about how the church came to be. The story is uh, full of drama. There's a violent wind, there are tongues of fire, there are miraculous languages, and a dramatic prophecy, preaching by Peter, the first sermon that he gives, really. In order to really understand that story, you have to understand that it's really soaked in symbolism. It's like a, the Russian doll of religious stories. There's just one thing inside of another, inside of another. So I want to take just a moment to start by unpacking it. 
The disciples are in Jerusalem, the city at the center of their religious life, the city where Jesus went on special religious holidays throughout his life, and the place where he was executed by the state, returned from the dead, and commissioned his disciples. Just one chapter earlier, we ascended into heaven, but not before giving them an ambitious job to share what they had seen and heard with the whole world. The old-fashioned word we use for doing that is witness. He asked them to be his witnesses. And then Jesus left. Now, at the same time, Jews from all over the world were coming to Jerusalem for the, past, for the festival of the Shabbat, uh, which is observed 50 days after Passover. The Passover celebration, as you may recall, is a ritual that remembers the people's liberation from slavery in Egypt. And 50 days after Passover, Jews from all over the world would gather in the holy city for a celebration of the wheat harvest. If Passover was about liberation, then Shabbat is about gratitude. The people literally brought their harvested wheat to the temple and gave thanks to the one who provided it. Now, I know that uh, you know, we, we kind of lump people into big groups. I mean, Americans are just Americans. We're all United, US citizens. You know, anybody uh, who's a Palestinian or an Arab you know, is, is all, they're all the same, right? Well, we think of that way as the Israelites, as a sing, single ethnic, ethnic group. But we have to remember that practicing Jews in Jesus' day uh, we're from many nations, from lots of cultures. Some uh, 500 years before the time of Jesus, the Babylonians had scattered them all over uh, the empire. And along the way, Judaism became less about ethnicity and more about the practices of Judaism. And one of those practices was returning to the temple for Shabbat. In fact, in, as Judaism became more about faithfulness to the law and these practices, Shabbat evolved from a harvest festival into a celebration of the Ten Commandments as well. And while it's not recorded in the scriptures, the rabbis like to say that after Moses received the commandments, tongues of fire came down from the mountain and shared the laws in 70 different languages so that it could be understood all around the world. So, our Christian story of Pentecost echoes and expands upon those themes. The word Pentecost is the Greek for Shabbat. The wind and the fire of the Holy Spirit echo the wind and the fire of Mount Sinai and the Ten Commandments. The languages of the people echo that rabbinic tradition. Even Peter's sermon is mostly an extended quote from the Hebrew scriptures in a section by the prophet Joel. So if this story of Pentecost is the story of our origin as Christian people, it's meant to explain who we are. And so it's interesting to explore what each of those Russian dolls is about. And I'm really only going to talk about two, but I'm going to, I want to share with you four, that, at least, that I hear in this story. The first is, Pentecost being linked to the Passover, 50 days afterwards. And so Pentecost is about liberation and freedom, setting captives free from slavery. Pentecost linked to Shabbat is about abundance. It's about gratitude. And Pentecost linked to Shabbat is also, uh, or a bit linked in Acts, is also ex an expansive version of inclusion not only though there are people from every nation gathered in that one place, but the Spirit allows them to hear and understand one another. And finally, Pentecost as a story is about fire. It's about passion, that thing that burns within us that we have to share with other people. It's a disruption of the status quo, even as it's a, recall, a call to return to our deepest values. It's a great story. And it's no surprise that when we lean into it once a, that we lean into it once a year, 
on the church's birthday. So let me share these two things that I think that uh, we have time to talk about today. And I'll get to it, but you got to hear the story first. When you make the effort to speak someone else's language, even if it's just basic phrases here and there, you are saying to them, I see you as a human being. Those words are in the memoir, Born in a Crime, Stories from a South African Childhood by the comedian Trevor Noah. There are 11 official languages in the nations of South Africa. And Trevor talked a lot about in his book the challenges and the gifts of languages in his childhood, growing up as a biracial boy in the days of apartheid. At home, the Noah family spoke Zosha, a native South African tongue. And when it came time to pray, though, they always prayed in English. Trevor's grandmother asked him to pray because his English was the best. The Bible is in English, she told him. So English prayers get answered first. Now, <laughs> that's kind of a funny line, right? Trevor Noah, comedian after all. But I can imagine how his grandmother came to that conclusion, even if no one ever explicitly said it. She first heard the Bible in English. She saw white English-speaking people in their comfortable lives in her country without the curfew or the travel restrictions that she and other black South Africans had faced. She prayed, certainly, but God must have been busy answering those English prayers first. And of course, we know the Bible wasn't written in English. We know that intellectually, but can't help but wonder and worry whether we, whether I, have carried on hurtful assumptions that were taught to Trevor Gra Trevor's grandmother. Are we still making the same mistakes as James and John imagining English speecher, speakers at the right and left hand of Jesus in the coming kingdom? Have we been saying, God bless America for so long that we've forgotten that God blesses every other nation too? And deep down, do we think that our prayers are answered first? So I'm guessing that God thought of all those questions before the church ever even came into being. God saw our failures coming, our shortcomings, our, saw our pride and our limited worldview and pre-answered our questions in the form of this Pentecost drama. The apostles gathered in a house, praying, waiting God, for God to make the next move, and a violent wind fills where they are, a wind that is unmistakably from God. The Spirit moves them to go outside of the house to preach God's power, and a crowd gathers, Jews from every nation, and I imagine it like a scene in Trevor Noah's book, a street full of people speaking 11 different languages. When the apostles start speaking, everyone hears the words all at the same time, all in their native tongues. And on that first Pentecost day, the Spirit has come like a miracle out that we've never seen out from underneath the sun. The apostles could have been miraculously. There could have been other ways that God showed that these were the new disciples of Jesus. Could have uh, come out and healed miraculously all their ailments of the people who had come to give their thanks. Or they could have been lifted off the ground and, and given uh, a power that any super pure, superhero would envy so that everybody would be impressed. But instead, instead, the Spirit gives them the gift of communication across language barriers. If those first apostles found themselves tempted to think that God answered their prayers first, the Spirit burst on the scene and blew their assumptions out of the water. God will pour out the Spirit, the Scripture says, on men and women, on young and old, on slave and free, and all who listen 
and here we'll be saved. That's the thing about the Spirit, about this Pentecost celebration. The Spirit, she doesn't have patience for unjust structures in the world. She doesn't care to who holds the cards, who has all the power, or who writes the checks, or doesn't have enough to go paycheck to paycheck. The Spirit is a leveling power, a uniting power. The wind blows where she chooses. When you make the effort to speak to someone in their language, Trevor writes, you are saying to them, I see you as a human being. The miracle of the Spirit on that first Pentecost was to let us hear and therefore see each other. The miracle of Pentecost was to bless our diversity and solidify our unity. That one global church was born of the Holy Spirit on that first Pentecost day. It's the good news in this story. The Spirit understands all our prayers. The miracle is when we understand each other, when we see one another. So it's a day of radical inclusion. It's the words from the old prophet Joel, whose time was so riddled with darkness and fear himself, that impetuous disciple Peter stands up. Jesus names him Rocky, remember, and he quotes redeploying to them the state of everyone in that room, in that world, in the streets. Everyone, young and old, slave and free, men servants and maid servants, all a part of God's plan. And that's important because it, the church is to be the church. If we are to be the body of Christ, we need every single person every hand and foot and eye and arm and leg and voice. None of us is excluded because we are not complete without one another. So we need uh, technicians who know how to run uh, a, a video machine and, and to edit a service. We need musicians who can play beautifully Whatever song we ask them to play, we need people who will help interpret that with their hands and their bodies. We need speakers and voices that can sing. We need each and every one of us to be a part of this great body of Christ, the Spirit and her unrelenting energy addressing all the frustration and confusion that arises from all the problems that we face in our world. And that's, I think, where the fire comes in. What is it that we are passionate about? What is it that we truly care about? Where are the things in our world that we know need to be corrected and changed? That's our calling. To see, as we see one another, to see where the hurts are. To understand the pain that other people are going through and to stand beside those folks and to work to make sure that the systems are corrected. There's a certain grounded wisdom in that celebration of Shabbat. I love that idea of people traveling long distances to the temple with harvest in hand to say thank you to God for whatever it is they may have. I don't think it's an accident that inside that process of gratitude that the people started to understand each other. But in that gratitude, they're also called to action. So what's the gratitude that we bring that we can put into action for our world? I don't know about you, but I've seen our young people in particular in our culture in the United States prophesying to us the high school students at Margaret Stoneham um, High School who experienced that mass shooting of their friends stood up and said, enough. They got on buses and went to the state capitol and asked the government 
to make a change. And they've been speaking ever since. Greta Thornburg, who, who's talking to the United Nations and to anyone who will listen that we need to do something about climate change. They see some of the problems. They care about the people who are affected by those problems. And they're speaking out. They're prophesying to us, saying, as Joel said, that we need to make changes in this world. Are we paying attention? Do we see one another? Do we hear the pain? And are we standing to make those changes that need to happen? Is that our burning fire? What is it? There was a, uh, uh, in Texas, there was a law passed not long ago prohibiting, prohibiting sanctuary cities. And in that state, many immigrants have been afraid to leave their home. So Father Michael Forge, a Texas priest, has started issuing homemade parish IDs. And he gives them to immigrant members of his congregation. The IDs, they don't have any, they don't have any legal standing, but they list the name of the person and their status as a member of the local church. And the church addresses and, uh, address and contact information is included on that card. The IDs have stopped some people from being arrested. It's a way of saying you belong to us, the priest has said, that you are a part of our family. This is a gratitude expression that goes hand in hand with action. Gratitude is practice. So today, of all those Russian doll imageries that come out of this story. What is it that speaks to you? What is it that fires you up? Who is it that you're seeing that you maybe haven't noticed in the past? Because unlike the menu, the cocktail menu at my, friend, at my friend's restaurant, we need to be the ones that people walk in and look at our church and say, their spirit forward. May it be so. Amen. So today in gratitude, I invite you to join with us in offering our prayer, the prayer of dedication that's printed in, your, in the order of service that should appear on your screen in a moment. We join with us in prayer. Blow off the dust of our fears, generous spirit, so we might be more giving people. Blow the dust off our material gifts we think are too small, so we might realize how they can bring hope and life to others. Blow the dust off our mistaken views of others, so we might see them as our sisters and brothers, ready to grace us even as, as we may, may bless them, them with, with these, these offerings. offerings. In, In Jesus', Jesus name, name we pray. We pray. Amen. Amen. Send down the fire of your justice. Send down the rains of your love. Come send down the Spirit, breathe life in your people, and we shall be people of God. Call us to be your compassion, teach us the song of your love. Give us hearts that sing, give us deeds that ring, make us ring with the song of your love. Send down the fire of your justice, send down the rains of your love. 
Come send down the Spirit, breathe life in your people, and we shall be people of God. Call us to learn of your mercy. Teach us the way of your peace. Give us hearts that feel. Give us hands that heal. Make us walk in the way of your peace. Send out the fire of your justice. Send out the rains of your love. Come send down the Spirit, breathe life in your people, and we shall be people of God. Call us to witness your kingdom. Give us the presence of Christ. May your holy light keep us shining bright. Ever shine with the presence of Christ. Send out the fire of your justice. Send down the rains of your love. Come send down the Spirit, breathe life in your people, and we shall be people of God. Will you join your hearts with me in a time of prayer? A spark. That's what we need this day, God of our imagination a spark to light our spirits so we can burst into bonfires, signaling that you are bringing to life and grace the presence of the Spirit through us that unites us, that makes us one. A word, a word, author of Pentecost, so that we can be the voice of those forgotten by the world, so that we might see and speak in that still small voice and be the ones who live out your good news, who create structures that bring grace and harmony and peace. A breeze, a breeze that stirs the soul this day, spirit of passion, a breeze that will bring us to life, will renew our relationships and send us on our way from this place to be brother and sister to each person that we meet. Yourself, Holy One. More than anything this day, we need yourself. We need that spirit within us that enlivens us, that speaks to us, that unites us, that burns a fire of passion within us, that allows us to act on your behalf today and all days so that we may be the witnesses that Jesus has called us to be. Even as we join our hearts in prayer, send down that spark, that word, that breeze. Hear us as we pray Jesus' prayer together. Amen. As the fire is bent for burning with a bright and warming flame, so the church is bent for mission, giving glory to God's name. As we witness to the gospel, 
we would build a bridge of care, joining hands across the nations, finding neighbors everywhere. We are learners, we are teachers, we are pilgrims on the way. We are seekers, we now because life is short. We have so little time to gladden the hearts of those who journey with us. So let us be generous with our love. Let us be kinder than is necessary. Let us never repay anyone evil for evil, but always overcome evil with good. And may the God of grace, who created you in God's own image, the God of love who has redeemed you and set you free, and the spirit of life that enlivens you and impassions you and empowers you to live this life of faith. Go with you today and always. Amen.